Hello, everybody, all our cardiologists and dear friends from all over the world. So this is the CEC course about echocardiography. And during this presentation, we'll be talking about the echocardiographic assessment in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. My name is Mohammed Sabir, lecturer of cardiology at Ain Shams University. To start with, uh, a summary of the outcomes we want to learn in this lecture. First, what is the definition of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or HOCAM? What are the different morphological types of HOCAM? What are the steps for the proper echocardiographic assessment of patients with classic HOCAM? What special tools, special echocardiographic tools that we may need? What are the other atypical forms of HOCAM that we may face in our daily practice? What's the differential diagnosis of HOCAM and how do we do screening for relatives of patients with HOCAM? To start with definition. Well, definition of HOCAM is very important. We may think that HOCAM is asymmetrical hypertrophy, HOCAM is LVT obstruction, HOCAM is SAM, Really, the definition of HOCAM is none of the above. The real echocardiographic definition of HOCAM, according to the ESC guidelines, is <clears throat> that the ventricular wall thickness, and we say ventricular, not left ventricular, we mean right or left ventricular wall thickness of 15 millimeters or more at any segment measured at the end of diastole in the presence of normal loading conditions. Again, the definition is very important. If you measure, if you measure any segment of the ventricular wall and find its thickness to be 15 millimeters or more, um, the measurement being done at end diastole with normal loading conditions, I mean without hypertension, without aortic stenosis. So this is hokum. Okay, we don't. Uh, diagnose HOCAM by asymmetric septal hypertrophy because we have other types of HOCAM with no asymmetrical septal hypertrophy. We don't diagnose HOCAM with SAM because SAM sometimes doesn't occur and it may occur in other conditions rather than HOCAM. So the definition is very important. Any segment in any of both ventricles with a thickness of 15 millimeters or more in the presence of normal loading conditions is HOCAM. <clears throat> We have many morphological classifications, the most recent, according to Parato et al, 2016, where they divided uh, the types of HOCAM into six types. The most common was septal hypertrophy, where the part of the left ventricle which is hypertrophied, which is affected, is the septum, which is the most common. We usually see in our clinical practice the type of HOCAM, which is the septal hypertrophy or the, or the one uh, characterized with asymmetrical sept septal hypertrophy. Other forms may be seen, but rather less common, like posterior wall hypertrophy, which is characterized with severe symptoms, like mid-wall mid hypertrophy, which is actually rare, like apical hypertrophy, uh, which is uh, known with the prominent ECG changes, apical hypertrophy, is usually associated with prominent uh, T-wave inversions in the precordial leads. We have the RV involvement and we have the mild form where there is the, the, the LVO thickness is mildly increased or mildly hypertrophied uh, within the range of 15 to 16 millimeters. Let's um, emphasize on each uh, type separately. First of all, the septal type, the septal hypertrophy type, which is characterized, as we see in this picture, with asymmetrical septal hypertrophy, where the ratio of the septal wall thickness to posterior wall thickness is more than 1.3. As we can see, at the end diastole with the mitral valve open, we have a septum that's very thick, and we have a posterior wall which is relatively of normal thickness. So this is the classic type of uh, HOCAM. Bear in mind that this type may be associated with LVO2 obstruction, sometimes not associated with LVO2 obstruction. And a variant of this type is the massive septal hypertrophy. If we have a very thick septum, 
with thickness, maximum thickness of more than 30 millimeters. That's the subtype of septal hypertrophy is the massive septal hypertrophy. And this, of course, carries a poor prognosis with high incidence of sudden cardiac death. So this is the first and the most common type, and this is the classic type of focum, the septal hypertrophy type. What other types exist? We have the asymmetrical posterior LV hypertrophy, which is quite rare. We have the mid-ventricular obstructive cardiomyopathy. As we see, the mid-septum uh, is hypertrophied, as we see in this picture, and may cause obstruction at the level of the RVOT. We have the apical hokum, which is rather uh, not uncommon. <clears throat> And we have two types, the non-massive type or Helmis type and the massive type, the Japanese or Yamaguchi type. As we can see, the apex is markedly hypertrophied. The LV cavity is almost completely obliterated by the hypertrophied apex, while at the basal septum and the basal parts of the ventricle, the wall thickness is almost normal. Okay, after we knew the definition of HOCOM and the morphological types, we'll start with steps of echocardiographic assessment. And in this um, uh, flow chart, we'll emphasize on classic HOCOM. We'll deal with other reforms of HOCOM at the end of the lecture, but in this uh, uh, detailed steps of echocardiographic assessment, we'll focus on classic HOCOM. Then what are the steps for echocardiographic assessment, you put the probe on the chest of the patient and you find left ventricular hypertrophy and you suspect hokum. How to move sequentially? First of all, you have to confirm the presence of hypertrophy. Then you have to define the pattern and the extent of hypertrophy. Then assessment of the LVOT gradient, then evaluation of the mitral valve apparatus, whether there is SAM or there's a mitral regurgitation, then assessment of left ventricular systolic and diastolic functions, as well as measurement of the left atrial volume, which is very important in prognosis. And last but not the least, clues to specific etiology. Step one, auscultate your patient. That's a general rule before uh, any echocardiographic assessment. It's better to put the stethoscope on the chest of the patient and auscultate him properly, because this will give you a clue to the diagnosis. If you're not acquainted with the murmur on this patient, you may easily miss the diagnosis of focum, especially if uh, you, you find a mild gradient on the LVT and then you don't perform any uh, provocative uh, maneuvers, you may easily miss hokum. But if you sculpted the patient and you uh, hear the ejection systolic murmur of hokum or of LVT obstruction, whatever the cause, then you'll be while performing the echocardiographic assessment, you'll be really uh, concentrating on the cause of the murmur and you'll examine the patient more properly and do all the tests and exhaust yourself with provocative measurements in order to reach the proper diagnosis. So don't forget to auscultate your patient. Next step is LV hypertrophy. <clears throat> As we can see, this is the parasternal long axis view. And when we look to the left ventricle, we can see that this is the classic form of focum. We have the septal hypertrophy and the posterior wall is all almost normal. Same in the parasternal short axis, we can uh, easily see the discrepancy in the thickness between the septum and the posterior wall. And if we measure the uh, maximal uh, wall thickness at the end of diastole in the septum and posterior wall by putting the M mod cursor parallel to the myocardium, we can measure the uh, thickness of both, uh, both septum and posterior wall. And you'll we'll find, of course, that uh, the uh, hypertrophy is asymmetrical. As we can see, he is putting the M mode cursor parallel to the myocardium and measuring the septal and posterior thickness. And the ratio would be, of course, more than 1.3. It's very important to measure the maximal LV wall thickness. You have to exhaust yourself in all views and measure where is the thickest part of, this, of the uh, LV. 
not just putting an M mode cursor on the uh, 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 basal part of the left ventricle in posterior short axis view and measuring the septum and posterior wall, we have to exhaust ourselves and measure all uh, segments of the left ventricle to determine where is the maximal alveolar thickness, because this is very important as the maximal alveolar thickness is part of the sudden cardiac death score of Hocum. So exhaust yourself with all the views, all apical views, apical four, apical two, and apical three chamber views, and uh, posterior long axis and short axis views. Use your M mode and repeat your M mode measurements at different uh, uh, planes of the LV to get the maximal LV wall thickness. So at this point, we reached that uh, this patient probably has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because we have one of the uh, one or more of the LV segments with a thickness of more than 16 millimeters. And this is the classic type with asymmetrical septal hypertrophy. So what's the next step? The next step is to assess the LVOT. Before assessing the LVOT, you have to bear in mind that asymmetrical septal hypertrophy is not pathognomonic of hokum. It's not a part of the, def the definition of hokum. It may occur in other diseases, like sigmoid septum in the elderly, or if a patient has LVH and an old posterior infarction, we will find the septum is markedly hypertrophied with a thinned out posterior. Or even patients with hypertension, sometimes the hypertrophy is not concentric and is eccentric or asymmetrical septal hypertrophy. So bear in mind that asymmetrical septal hypertrophy occurs in other diseases rather than HOCAM. And also in that not all patients with HOCAM have asymmetrical septal hypertrophy because we have a lot of different morphological types of HOCAM. Next step, dynamic LVOT obstruction. <clears throat> and when you start assessing the LVOT, and bending your uh, probe anteriorly to open the left ventricular outflow tract and the aortic valve, you have to exhaust yourself to know where is the proper site of obstruction. Because if you find this uh, picture of color aliasing at the LVOT, you may easily uh, miss it and say, oh, well, the, the most common cause is a sclerocrasific aortic valve with severe aortic stenosis. And so this is a case of aortic stenosis. <clears throat> you have to exhaust yourself to find where is the site of the color aliasing? Is it at the site of the aortic valve? No. Really, in this view, the aortic valve is still not open. And we see the starting of the aliasing at the site of the basal septum and the mitral valve. So this obstruction is at the LVOT, not at the level of the aortic valve. <clears throat> Another uh, uh, step to confirm that the level of obstruction as the LVOT of the aortic valve is to use the pulse wave, not the continuous wave Doppler, because as we all know, pulse wave Doppler measures the gradient at the point where you put the cursor. So if you put pulse wave at the aortic valve, you'll find normal flow, but, but at the LVOT, you'll find marked gradient of the LVOT obstruction, high gradient of acceleration of flow at the LVOT. <clears throat> So uh, after confirming that the uh, obstruction is the level of LVOT of the aortic valve, we'll put continuous wave Doppler and measure the maximal gradient across the LVOT. Of course, we all know that the, uh, uh, that the shape of the uh, Doppler wave in LVOT obstruction is the dagger shape. As we all see in this picture, is the dagger shape, and we measure the maximal gradient across the LVOT. There's a technical point in patients with hokum, and it's a very common mistake, because if you bend your probe a slightly posterior from the LVOT, you'll find a much higher gradient than that of the LVT obstruction, which, which is the gradient of mitral regurgitation, because almost all cases of Hocum have mitral regurgitation, which may be mild, may be moderate, may be severe, but usually it is present. So if you're not cautious while measuring LVOT gradient, you may get a much higher uh, gradient, a false gradient 
you, f you find you you may think that this is the LVAT obstruction, and well, this is not the LVAT obstruction. This is the mitral regurgitation jet. Mitral regurgitation jet. If you measure it, it reflects the systolic blood pressure of the patient. So you may find velocities up to five meters per second, which is wrong. So how to make sure that you're measuring properly the LVAT gradient and not the mitral regurgitation? You have to sweep your probe from anterior to posterior. The LVOT gradient is an anterior uh, gradient, while if you go more posterior, you'll find the gradient of mitral regurgitation. Of course, LVOT jet is dagger shaped, while that of mitral regurgitation is rather oval. Mitral regurgitation usually exceeds five meters per second. Usually, LVOT gradients do not exceed that. Usually, the maximum will be four, 4.5. And you can also use the apical three-chamber view, which will differentiate properly between the LVOT and the mitral volume. So we now have measurements of the alveolar thickness. We have measurement of the LVOT obstruction. Now we have to confirm, we have to confirm that this LVOT gradient is a dynamic one because Usually, LVT or uh, that's a rule that LVT obstruction in Hokum is a dynamic obstruction. It is a muscle obstruction. It is not uh, a fixed gradient. So, LVT obstruction at rest is more than 30 millimeters mercury. If you don't find that gradient reaching 30 millimeters mercury, we have to do additional provocation tests like, like valsalva maneuver. While the patient is on the bed, he can perform a valsalva maneuver or he may stand or he may perform exercise with his legs in order to uh, confirm that this gradient increases with uh, the physiological provocation maneuvers. Of course, don't use dobutamine echo because it is it may cause collapse of for patients with hope. And if we found an LVOT gradient of more than 50 millimeters mercury, this is the threshold at which we can say that LVT obstruction is hemodynamically important. And at this level, it starts to cause symptoms like syncopal attacks. So LVT obstruction is defined as 30 at rest or provocation. If you find it uh, at rest less than 30, you have to do the provocation. And if we find it more than 50 millimeters mercury, that will start to cause symptoms. And this is the flow chart as given by the ESC guidelines <clears throat> for the assessment of LVT obstruction. So if you find the maximum provoked peak gradient of more than 50, so you have the, the definition of uh, patient with hokum and outflow obstruction. If it's less than 50, then you see if the patient is asymptomatic, then fine. You have just to follow up your patient. But if he is symptomatic, you have to further investigate whether this gradient of below 50 is the cause of symptoms by in, uh, causing uh, or starting your provocation tests to see whether this gradient will rise below, above 50 or not, whether it's exercise stress, echocardiography, or standing or valsalva. If it's more than 50, then you have your diagnosis of outflow obstruction. If still, still less than 50, then this is Hokum without LVOT obstruction, and you start managing this patient medically. Step four is assessment of the mitral valve apparatus. And of course, we all know the uh, common finding we see in about 60 to 70% of patients with Hokum is SAM, which is systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve during systole where it hits the septum. As we see in M mode, the anterior mitral valve leaflet will hit the septum during systole, as we all see in this view. Again, hitting of the anterior mitral valve leaflet to the septum during systole. This is the abnormal hitting or a proximity of the anterior mitral valve leaflet seen in M mode. As we can see, the mitral valve almost touches the septum during systole. This is called systolic anterior 
motion of the anterior mitral valve leaflet. What is the mechanism of SAM? SAM is purely a venturi effect. Due to the severe LVT obstruction, the mitral valve leaflet is sucked towards the septum, causing uh, systolic anterior motion and uh, contributing more to LVT obstruction. As we say, obstruction begets obstruction. With more LVT obstruction, you'll have more SAM, and SAM adds to the LVT obstruction, and we go in a vicious cycle. SAM may also be exacerbated by elongated mitral valve leaflets, usually in patients with hokum. The mitral valve leaflets are a bit elongated, so this makes the suction effect uh, easier to uh, to be done with higher uh, incidence of SAM in patients with obstructive hokum. Assessment of the mitral valve apparatus should not only be uh, 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 should not only be concentrating on SAM. We have to also assess mitral regurgitation, and this is very important. Before assessment of mitral regurgitation, this is a slide about grading of SAM. We have three grades according to the mitral valve septal separation, the distance between the mitral valve and the septum. If it's more than 10 millimeters, this is grade one. This is the mildest form of SAM. If the mitral valve septal separation is less than 10 millimeters, or if it is uh, contact, I mean that the mitral valve and the septum touch each other for less than 30% of this is told, this is grade two. In grade three, we have mitral valve septal contact. They touch each other for more than 30% of the stool, which is the most severe form of SAM. As we said, SAM is not a part of the definition of HOCAM. We may have other causes of SAM rather than HOCAM. And we may have patients with HOCAM to, who do not have SAM. SAM occurs only in 60, on 60 to 70% of cases. So what other causes of SAM? Elderly with hypertension, hypovolemia, we have a vigorous contraction of the ventricle, and we may have a slight mild gradient across the LVT, and that may cause suction and SAM. Takotsubo syndrome and post-aortic valve replacement. All of these are causes of SAM. We have to differentiate SAM from pseudo-SAM, which may occur in normal individuals with vigorous LV systole, especially in athletes or in patients who have hypovolemia. How to differentiate? In true SAM, the peak of SAM precedes the peak inward movement of the posterior wall. If we correlate SAM with the posterior wall contraction, we'll find that the peak of SAM precedes the peak of posterior wall contraction in true SAM, but in pseudo SAM, they coincide simultaneously. <clears throat> And please don't forget that we have a subtype of SAM, which is cordial SAM. The SAM may occur at the level of the cordine sparing the leaflets. So we have the leaflets not forming SAM, but at the level of the cordy, you have the suction of the cordy during the systole. And this is this uh, uh, when you apply M mode, this can be easily differentiated whether it is uh, SAM of the anterior mitral leaflet or it's a SAM of the cordy. So as we said, Assessment of the mitral valve is not only SAM, we have to assess the mitral regurgitation, which is extremely important. Not just assessment of the severity of mitral regurgitation, as we do usually by vena contracta and the regurgitant uh, volume and whatever. It's very important to determine the cause of mitral regurgitation because mitral regurgitation in HOCA may be due to SAM and may be due to an intrinsic mitral valve pathology or maybe both. But we have really different surgical treatment for both. If the mitral regurgitation is due to SAM, then if we do myomectomy and improve the LVT gradient, then the mitral regurgitation will disappear. But if we have an intrinsic mitral valve pathology like mitral valve prolapse, then myomectomy should be associated with repair of this uh, prolapsing mitral valve leaflet or else we'll uh, end up postoperatively with a patient with no LVT obstruction, but with significant mitral regurgitation. So it's very important in decision making. How to differentiate SAM related mitral regurgitation from that of uh, an intrinsic uh, mitral valve pathology? Well, SAM related mitral regurgitation is usually dynamic and its, uh, its severity varies with the degree of SAM, it correlates with the degree of SAM, and it's usually a posteriorly directed jet. While if we have 
a mitral regurgitation due to prolapse, then you have a central or anteriorly directed jet. And sometimes in by transthoracic echo, we cannot really differentiate whether this is a prolapse or just SAM, and we usually need a TE in these cases, and maybe 3D TE to properly delineate the mitral valve scallops and to exclude mitral valve prolapse. So as we can see in this apical four chamber view, if we put color, we can find some mitral registration. And <clears throat> as we all know, when you find mitral registration, we have to examine in all views, not just in the apical four chamber, because as we see, if we shift from apical four to apical three chamber, you will find a massive jet of mitral regurgitation, almost moderate to severe mitral regurgitation, which was not uh, visualized in the apical four chamber. So do not uh, uh, forget to sweep across all apical chamber, uh, apical uh, views, so that we can properly delineate the mitral regurgitation. So as we say, as we have seen in this uh, echocardiographic video, in this case the uh, mitral registration is an eccentric one, so we have to properly assess all uh, all uh, views. And this is and this jet of mitral registration is actually what we call the uh, posteriorly directed jet, which is usually related to SAM without any uh, mitral valve apparatus abnormality. Next is assessment of systolic and diastolic functions, which is uh, which is easy. By M mode, <clears throat> we uh, we usually find the LV cavity is small in Hocken because we have uh, marked hypertrophy of hypertrophy of the myocardium, and we have usually normal ejection fraction. And of course, the Simpson's method will give better, uh, more accurate assessment of the ejection fraction. Don't forget that in some cases there is late systolic dysfunction, in around ten percent of cases, which is known as the burnout phase. And of course, don't forget to assess stress sting segmental emotional abnormality because HOCAM has association with coronary artery disease. You may be concentrating on measurements and LV2 obstruction and maximum LV wall thickness and SAM, and you forget that the patient has significant hypokinesia in, for example, the anterior wall, and he may have a lesion in all of the coronary arteries that may need intervention. So please do not forget assessing, assessing the segmental wall motion abnormality. When you do an echocardiographic study, you have to do it carefully and assess everything. Don't be uh, uh, distracted by the main pathology and leave other findings unattended. Diastolic function, usually all cases of HOCAM have LV diastolic dysfunction. We usually assess the diastolic function, as we all know, by assessing the EA ratio at the mitral inflow velocity. It may be reversed, which is grade one, or so normal grade two, maybe or may reach up to grade three. And then the, uh, the tissue Doppler assessment of uh, LV diastolic function, of course, at the mitral annulus, at the septal and the lateral mitral annuli, will have, of course, a reduced E prime velocity, which is less than nine centimeters per second and will have an increase in the E over E prime ratio, more than eight, which indicates high LV filling pressure. And as we see in this Doppler study at the mitral inflow, we have a reversed E ratio, which is grade one diastolic dysfunction. And then when we assess the diastolic function using <clears throat> TDI, we'll find uh, depressed uh, myocardial relaxation velocity more or less than nine centimeters per second, as we can see, which denotes that you have significant diastolic dysfunction. <clears throat> After assessment of the left ventricle, don't forget to assess the left atrium. M mode measurement of the left atrium is part of SCD score. So the size of the left atrium correlates with prognosis and correlates with the incidence of sudden cardiac death. And also don't forget to measure the left atrium volume index using the area length method and then dividing it on the surface area. If more than 34 millimeters per meter square, this is a bad prognostic mark. To summarize M mode in Hocum, we'll find asymmetrical septal hypertrophy in classic types. We'll find small LV cavity, SAM, 
dilated left atrium, and a mid-systolic notching of the aortic valve, which is also seen in many patients with Hocum. Mid-systolic notching of the aortic valve will be due to a drop in the ejection velocity in the mid-systole because of the complete obstruction of the LBOT. <clears throat> Sixth step, close to etiology. If we find a patient with Hocum, some clues may lead us to the cause of Hocum if present. For example, amyloidosis is very characterized by an, a thickness of the interatrial septum. Also, amyloidosis associated with increased thickness of the AV valves and also pericardial effusion and the very characteristic ground glass appearance of the myocardium or the speckled appearance of the myocardium. Affection of the RV wall occurs, occurs also in amyloidosis, myocarditis, anderson fabry disease, Noonan, and other diseases. If we find the LVH is concentric, as we said, not all cases have eccentric LVH. If we find, if we find concentric LVH, you have to think of infiltrative diseases like glycogen storage diseases. Extreme LVH, more than 30 millimeters, you may uh, uh, have the diagnosis of Danon or Pomp's disease. If you have LV hypokinesia, that's associated with mitochondrial diseases and other mutations, and right ventricular outflow tract obstruction, as we said, with the mid uh, cavitary uh, hocum may be associated with Noonan syndrome. So these are some clues to etiology, if, if present, some etiologies of hocum. The last step is that we may use special tools. All of uh, what uh, has preceded, we have talked about transthoracic echo, the classic transthoracic echo. What about TE? What about 3D echo? What about contrast echo, exercise echo, and speckle tracking echocardiography? So first of all, TE <clears throat> may be used if the patient has a poor acoustic window in transthoracic echo, or if you suspect, for example, a subaortic membrane, you cannot differentiate whether this obstruction is due to subaortic membrane or if it is an LV hypertrophy and LVOT obstruction, so we may use TE. Of course, assessment of the mitral valve, as we said, to exclude the intrinsic mitral valve pathology, which is very important in uh, tailoring the surgical management of HOCAM. If we have prolapsing mitral valve leaflets, we may need mitral valve repair with myomectomy. And of course, intraoperative guidance when we do myomectomy, whether this is sufficient or the, we have a residual LVT gradient, whether we need mitral valve repair or not, that's very important. So these are the guidelines for TE assessment, as we said. Recommended as a class one in all patients under, undergoing septal myectomy to confirm the presence of LVT obstruction and to guide intraoperatively the surgical strategy and also to exclude post surgical complications. Class 2A TE should be considered in patients with LVOT obstruction if it's an unclear uh, mechanism or when we have severe mitral regurgitation and, of course, intracoronary contrast injection. Class 2A also may be used uh, to guide the septal alcohol hypertrophy when we use it transcatheter. 3D echo, just for demonstration. So this is the uh, normal 3D echo with the mitral valve and the LVOT patent, while in Hocum, as you can see, that the anterior mitral valve leaflet shifted, is shifted towards the LVOT and the LVT is almost uh, completely obstructed due to uh, the presence of SAM. All right. What about contrast echo? If we inject uh, uh, contrast like microbubbles or other contrasts into the LV cavity, we do LV cavity opacification and more accurate LV all thickness measurement can be done. As we see here, the uh, in, in, when we inject a contrast, the myocardium is well delineated and can be more easily measured. And also in cases of apical hypertrophy, you can see the LV cavity with the shape of ace of spades. This is characteristic for the apical form of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Exercise echo, as you said, can be used uh, uh, to um, uh, visualize the latent LVOT obstruction. If we have a gradient at the LVOT, which is mild, but yet the patient is symptomatic, we can use exercise, not the vitamin echo, just exercise echo, like on the cycle ergometer. Uh, 
in order to uh, propagate the LVT gradient to increase so that we can <clears throat> correlate this LVT obstruction with symptoms. Of course, to exclude ischemic heart disease, we can see worsening of mitral regurgitation with ex exercise echo. If we have mild mitral regurgitation and we do exercise, it may increase to moderate or severe mitral regurgitation, especially if we are suspecting this clinically. As we said, mitral regurgitation is dynamic due to the dynamic SAM. Assessment of contractile reserve and assessment of exercise tolerance for prognosis. All of these are uses of exercise echo in Hokum. Specular tracking, of course, we can delineate which part of the LV is more affected with myocardial dysfunction and fibrosis. Uh, and to detect the subtle myocardial dysfunction, we have a normal erection fraction, but an impaired global inclusion strain, which is due to subtle myocardial dysfunction. So what are other forms of hokum exist? Rather than the septal one, we have the apical hokum, of course. Uh, courtesy of Dr. Ahmed Mohsen uh, gave me this beautiful uh, case of uh, apical affection of uh, hokum. As we see, the basal parts are almost spared, yet the LV cavity at the side of the apex is completely obliterated as we see and this is the beautiful picture of the ace of spades which is characteristic of the lv cavity in patients with apical hokum as we said we have two types we have the helmi type and the amaguchi which is the massive apical affection and in this case usually we don't uh, uh, find uh, sam but we find the dagger shape of lvt of, uh, of uh, not lvt actually left ventricular obstruction at the mid cavity or near the apex. What about RV involvement? Don't forget, Hocum may also affect the right ventricle, as we see in this video, that the right ventricle role is affected with hypertrophy, not just the left ventricle, because Hocum can affect both ventricles, especially in filtrative diseases. And don't forget the mild disease. I usually don't forget this case, which was uh, referred to me in the echo lab by one of my professors. This was an 18 years old female and she had multiple true syncopal attacks. This professor performed an ECG at his clinic for the patient and the ECG was not normal. We had prominent T wave inversion at the precordial leads. And she, was, she, she did an echo somewhere outside and, and it was uh, normal. So this professor suspected Hokum and he sent it to the cath lab in the university, to the, sorry, to the echo lab in the university. And as we see, we had just one segment with uh, a thickness of 16 millimeters. So please correlate, please auscultate your patient, please listen to the patient's history carefully and examine the patient properly because you may have just one LV segment with an uh, thickness of more than 15 millimeters, then you have the diagnosis of Hocum uh, done. So what does ECHO uh, give us? What prognostic aspects does the ECHO provide? First of all, as we said, if we have massive LV hypertrophy more than 30 millimeters, this is a bad prognostic sign. Of course, if you have an LV apical aneurysm, severe LV obstruction, severe mitral regurgitation, left atrium volume index of more than 34 millimeter, milliliters per meter square, speckle tracking echo and a global exclusion strain less than 15%. And if we have the burnout phase or progress, progressive LV wall thinning. We have some differential diagnosis with HOCAM like athlete heart and other causes of uh, LVOT obstruction, how to differentiate athlete heart from HOCAM. Well, in athlete heart, usually we have a normal LV cavity, you have normal diastolic filling, these patients are fit and they have normal LV diastolic function, we have a normal left atrial size, usually they are males. And if we decondition, if we they stop the exercise, then the LV or thickness will regress and they do not have family history of hokum. While in hokum, the pattern of LVH is usually the unusual pattern, the eccentric pattern, we have small LV cavity, we have marked left atrial enlargement, we have the abnormal ECG, we have abnormal LV diastolic filling. Usually they are females, not usually they are females, but if we find the female sex with picture of uh, uh, the marked LV hypertrophy, usually this, this will not be due to 
Athletics, usually it will be Hokum, and of course, a positive feminist of Hokum favors that this is Hokum, not an athlete heart. Of course, valvular aortic stenosis is a very common, uh, tricky uh, differential diagnosis because this is the most common cause of obstruction in this site, not Hokum. So you have to look caref carefully by 2D to assess the valve's mobility. In Hokum, the valve's mobility is normal, the aortic valve opens and closes normally, but in valvular aortic stenosis, it's limited. The level of aliasing, as we said, the color obstruction is it at the level of the aortic valve or isn't high up in the LVOT. The obstruction is static if you have aortic stenosis with the propagation that's not affecting it much, but there is significant affection or increase if we have propagation test in cases of Hocum and pulse wave Doppler can differentiate the exact site of obstruction as we said. Don't forget also the subaortic membrane. If we have a discrete membrane below the aortic valve with normal alveol thickness or the alveolar thickness may be slightly increased due to the obstruction, but without SAM, without asymmetrical uh, 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 hypertrophy. Sorry, the video is not working. Restart it again. I think there's a problem in the video. No problem. As we see in this static picture, the uh, the membrane is discrete one. The rest of the LV is not that hypertrophied, which we have a discrete membrane with um, obstruction of most of the LVOT. So this is a subaortic membrane, not Hocum. At the end, don't forget that screening of family members, the asymptomatic family members of affected patients is very important. And in defining HOCAM in these patients, we use a cutoff value of 13, not 15 millimeters. According to the age, we uh, follow up the, these patients echocardiographically. Below 12, echo is optional, unless there is a family history of early death or the, the child is symptomatic or he's a competitive athlete. From the age of 12 to 18, we usually perform echo every uh, year or one and a half years because this is the age at which there is the peak of diagnosis of focum in these uh, patients. And after 18 to 21 years, we usually do it every five years because the frequency of diagnosis after the age of 21 is quite low. Okay, that's the end of my lecture. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope this will give you a guide to how to interrogate and diagnose patients with HOCAM systematically without missing any of the details. Thanks a lot and see you in another presentation. Bye-bye.